Welcome to the Final Note Interviews. My guest today is an award-winning longtime composer of many different pieces and genres and a recipient of the George Peabody Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Music in America. Deep Summer Music and Symphony One Water Music are some of my favorites. Libby Larson, as I live and breathe, how are you this morning? It's cold, windy, and sad over here. <laughs> um, so my first question is a very basic, uh, easy question, and that's when and how did you first? When and how did you first become interested in music? You know, I uh, was fortunate to have gone to a particular grade school in Minneapolis, Minnesota, a school that was then called Christ the King Catholic School, and. Um, that was in the 1950s. That school uh, had a had a way of teaching uh, children uh, to read and write music in first grade. So we all learned to, to read music and to write music in, when we were five, six-year-olds. We continued to do that uh, as uh, part of our curriculum uh, for eight years. So um, I, I became very fluent in, in uh, writing the music that was already in my head. Uh, and I always got in trouble because I, I talk out of turn. So instead of getting uh, uh, put in the corner or wrapped on the knuckles uh, by my teachers, I would simply go in my head and compose music, uh, something that I've done from age 5 until uh, age 66, which I am now. So when and why did you decide to become a composer? Um, I, uh, it, it's kind of a mystery to me uh, why I decided, ah, I'm, I'm going to compose with my life. Uh, but I was, I, I recall very clearly that I was um, sitting in a class. I think it might have been an opera history class. Don't, I don't really remember. But I do remember that it just suddenly in my mind I said to myself, you know, you could compose music every day of your life if you're a composer. Uh, and, um, and so long about that time, I, between sophomore and, and junior year uh, in college, I knew that I was going to com- compose music uh, for, as my journey through, through life. Was there ever any worry about becoming a composer, about being able to make, having a, a life or a career of making music and being able to support yourself at the same time? down the road of peace, which at that point was at age 30, really old. Uh, and um, I had a wonderful group of, of colleagues, many of whom are still my very close friends, all, all, and all of whom were composers. And we just started talking about what does the world look like for us since we decided to, that composing music is what we're going to do with our lives. We uh, took a close look at what was available for composers. You could become a film composer. You could uh, work in commercial uh, uh, music. You could uh, write symphonies or operas or string quartets. Um, but the path that was a, that we all wanted to pursue was the path of uh, what you would call classical music, writing for classical uh, instruments. And at that point in time, that would have been in the 1970s, the career path for a composer like myself was to uh, uh, teach in college, become a, a member of a music faculty at some college. And um, it turned out that none of us actually wanted to do that. Uh, uh, we wanted to compose music. So we got together and had many long talks over coffee and sticky buns and, and the occasional uh, bottle of wine. We decided that we needed to create for ourselves a marketplace. Uh, and, um, and so we formed the Minnesota Composers Forum at, uh, at that time, uh, and which is now the, the American Composers Forum, the largest of its kind, I think, in the world, a place where you can express yourself through music as your focal point uh, in your life. We just filled a void, uh, and we didn't actually worry about making a living. We worried about creating circumstances for uh, composition and for audiences to hear our work. Now, if I have this right, 
Uh, you're what I guess some people term, and this might be a, a large thing. I don't know. I I haven't looked into it much, but uh, you're what some people would term a music philosopher, and I was wondering what that might entail. I view the world uh, as a non chronological uh, place, mm-hmm. um, and I view music as uh, human beings' natural tendency to reflect themselves through sound. And so when I uh, give a talk or am asked to speak uh, uh, at a convention, say for instance, like the ACDA convention, which is in town in Minneapolis this week, um, I tend to want to approach what I talk about uh, through, through the humanities and through cultural anthropology and use music as a way to view, to view the world. So if, if that is philosophizing, then um, that, is what, that is one of the ways that I express myself uh, through music. Uh, one of my favorite pieces of yours is summer music. Perhaps give me your thoughts on that piece, because that's a piece that's really colorful and vibrant and really relaxing and kind of reflective of uh, some, some of the other pieces that you've written. Uh, not all of them, but some. Yeah. And they, they have this great uh, attention to detail. This summer music and water music have this kind of attentiveness to the vibes and feelings and sensations one can get from the world around them that many people may experience if not entirely notice them um so so what are your thoughts on summer music and what was the intention there with that piece well um the intention uh uh, was to create a a deep sense of uh, peacefulness uh and um and if not contentment, but that feeling that all is right, not necessarily with the world, but that all is right. And um, Deep Summer Music had an interesting creative process uh, in that I was invited uh, by a very small town in Minnesota, Terrace, Minnesota, uh, to uh, compose a piece uh, for the Minnesota Orchestra. The town had invited the Minnesota Orchestra to uh, to their mill, and um, and then invited all of Western Minnesota to uh, come and come to the orchestra concert. And so they wanted to commission a piece uh, that that um, I guess reflected uh, their connection to music. Uh, so I went to Terrace, Minnesota. Its population was about eighty people, eight zero uh, people. And, and um, I spent a weekend there, and I interviewed uh, uh, maybe 50 of those 80 people. I uh, uh, went to their homes, uh, drank coffee with them, had uh, sweets and pastries, talked to them um, with, talked with them about their love of music and um, their love of Terrace, Minnesota. And um, I, I, I came away feeling like th- that I would be just fine in that town and um, and then as I drove uh, back to Minneapolis, it's a couple hour drive uh, from Western Minnesota, um, I, I felt uh, in myself that one of the things I love, truly love about uh, living uh, where I do is I love to, uh, to drive through fields of ripened crops. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, um, and especially in August, when it's hot and it's the dog days and the crops are just bursting, they're so ripe that I I wanted to somehow make a piece of music that expressed Ooh. that kind of peacefulness. Uh, it's hard to come by these days, uh, hmm. uh, but um, uh, but what I tried to do was to uh, reflect in sound um, what it what it looks and feels like to be in a field of ripened, well, let, let's say oats uh, or corn. Uh, and um, you can see the wind, even if there's a little tiny wind, uh, 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 working on the surface of the crops in a thousand modes of oscillation. And then if you look further, you can see the horizon of uh, trees. And if you look Beyond that, you see the sky, and in the sky, you see the clouds, and everything is oscillating gently and also in concert with each other. So I uh, uh, worked hard to create that picture, uh, uh, but not tell you what.
what it is. You don't have to think that when you when you hear the piece. But you but but that picture I think uh, uh, it, uh, it suggests a, a deep kind of contentment in bounty. So what about your your first symphony? I I, I believe it was your first symphony, Water Music. Yes, it was. Yeah. It's a very lively piece. Very uh. A colorful piece. It's, I guess, it might be kind of similar in terms of, again, wanting to capture that essence of something within nature or something nice, something pleasant, but also a very colorful piece. And uh, I think the I think it's the third movement that gets a bit crazy <laughs> and uh, fun and in your face. But it's it's a really great symphony, and I think. Uh, it was back in '85 that it was first performed, or something around that time, and still holds up. Uh, <laughs> it's still one of my favorite pieces. So, what what was your thoughts and creative process for that piece? Um, well, that piece, because it was my first symphony, mm -hmm. um, I I wanted to write about something that uh, uh, that I know, mm -hmm. and. And one of the things I know from living in Minneapolis and Minnesota uh, is I, I know water. <laughs> I know it in all its forms, uh, uh, and uh, frozen and, and fluid. I also grew up uh, racing sailboats, so I know, I know water and wind <laughs> together. Uh, and uh, with the um, symphony water music, at its base layer uh, is the interaction of uh, of wind and water and and a human all, all in one I wanted to see if I could rather than describe uh, waves and wind and water uh, if I could actually create an, an experiential piece so that you actually feel as if you're getting you know uh, uh, splashed with water or or you're becalmed or uh, at the third movement um, uh, if you're a sailor uh, and you you watch the surface of the water, there are these there are squalls of many many kinds, and um, and a, a certain kind of squall, squall called a cat's paw. It just mm -hmm. um, it, uh, the wind hits the water and then the squall spreads out like a cat's paw, uh, and uh, it can tip you over immediately. Mm -hmm. So um, I. Uh, with deep summer music and with symphony water music and with with all of my music, I am looking to to offer the perception of actually being water or being uh, that that we, that we feel, or like with four on the floor or at, or or driving being in that car driving very fast. Uh, it's something that I uh, have always done with music. And it springs from my own uh, definition of, of composition, mm -hmm. which is making an order of sound in time and space in order to communicate what it's like to be alive. Yeah, and, and on that note, I mean, there are, there's definitely a, a lot of pieces that uh, people can find of your work, whether it's in CD or digital format or anything like that. But there are still some pieces that I, I kind of noticed that I, I don't know if they are in any format yet. Because I know there was like one piece I saw called Earth that was yeah. performed by the, the, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. And I think there were you know, a few others. And I was just wondering, is it are those pieces like ever going to see like maybe a physical release on CD? Because I know that's kind of hard for the composer to tell whether any of that's going to happen or not. But You know, um, in the case of Earth, uh, which is... Uh, which I composed for the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra. Mm -hmm. um, I have been trying to get a recording from them uh, mm -hmm. since they performed it, uh, uh, but to no avail. The, the that symphony is going through some administrative uh, mm -hmm. upheaval, uh, mm -hmm. and even if I did get a recording from them, I would not be allowed to uh, put it up on uh, digital media or press a CD from it uh, because of the musicians' union rules. So there are pieces that I that I have com I've composed uh, that uh, that I would need to find a way to get those pieces onto a digital format that I could distribute, uh, and um, that's been that's been an interesting uh, challenge I think for composers throughout the country for for the last sixty years uh, that um, that in fact if you if you have a fine performance by a a fine professional. Uh, Ensemble, there are negotiations and the the changing of uh, of 
money uh, in order for that piece to uh, and that performance uh, to be available to the world. Who might some of your favorite composers or musicians be that may have influenced you or was just stuff that you really liked? <laughs> of uh, Berlioz's music. He actually came at his compositions not by the keyboard. He was a guitarist. And you can hear it uh, in his music. Not You can't hear c guitar pieces, but you can hear the way that he hears how sound uh, works in the air. Uh, and I'm, I'm continually fascinated uh, with, with how, how transparent his, uh, his music uh, can be. Uh, I um, also went through a big stint of loving Stravinsky's music, which I, I do. I love his music, uh, and I love his orchestral techniques and his voicing. And, and um, Bartok, whose music I admire, especially his quest to translate the, the language of his people uh, through the rhythms that he employs in his music. He is also able to evoke feeling in a way that um, that is uh, more connecting than, than perhaps Stravinsky's music. And now, that's it. The American culture has in, you know, has evolved its own music. So many of my heroes uh, come, come really through the uh, American culture. Uh, Louis Armstrong uh, is, is one of my heroes. Uh, Carl Stalling, Looney Tunes fame, is another hero. Uh, Chuck Berry. Uh, Big Mama Thornton, uh, Chicago. <laughs> uh, uh, let's see who else. There's there's many, and they populate my my studio on any given day when I'm working on a piece. <laughs> Suddenly, up Chuck Berry will show up uh, in, in in my head, and I'll have to uh, say, well, why are you here? What you know? And he's usually here to say something about the piece that I'm working on. Uh, I know that sounds a little bit insane, but um, it is true that. The, the work you admire uh, it comes with you into the studio, uh, and uh, the challenge is is to be uh, authentic uh, in the material that actually uh, goes down on paper. No, sounds normal to me. It makes sense. <laughs> um, so then, what might some of your and this might this might be another challenging question because it might be a lot, but what might some of your favorite pieces be? Some of your favorite works. <laughs> uh, <laughs> everyone. So, um, let me let me pick out some. Uh, 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 Symphony Fantastique, uh, The Rite of Spring, Concerto for Orchestra, uh, Marteau Saint Maitre. These are all orchestral pieces. Mm -hmm. uh, then there are a number of number hundreds of chamber pieces uh, that that I truly admire. Uh, oh, I should in in the um, uh, in the orchestral repertoire, also La Mer, uh, mm. uh, gosh, and um, and all of the Prokofiev symphonies mm. and um, uh, and Shostakovich five, uh, and is that enough? <laughs> it's a good, it's a good amount. Did you mean the Fifth Symphony of Shostakovich? Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. my favorite too. I love that one. <laughs> it's very uh, uh, oppressive at times and dark in certain movements but that final movement i love most of all it's the perfect capper for that symphony <laughs> so i know at one point you and this is i mean i never know how much what information to rely on when it comes to the internet but you once did a research subject on what the modern young person maybe 30 20 40 or uh in their teens or whoever they may be you know what their reaction was to classical music today whether it was the original music or uh mo modern classical music that was being made in the present but and it, it was the part of the research project was to find out what it was about classical music that put some people off put them away and some aspects that uh, they enjoyed about it. And there, there always 
it's still a topic today. It's it's a question of whether or not the youth is interested in classical music, whether or not they should be. My question is, what are your thoughts on the state of music today, in general or classical? I grew up hearing that classical music was dying, mm-hmm. uh, and that um, and that for some reason uh, kids just didn't have the concentration power to to listen to it, uh, and. Um, uh, what I experienced, actually, is that um, classical music uh, has redefined itself uh, throughout the century. There is a repertoire that is that um, made up the uh, Victor Red Seal record box that went out with the gramophones, uh, and that um, is the repertoire that is orchestras and schools of music call core repertoire. Um, and that repertoire uh, has perpetuated itself as the classical music industry uh, ha- has built itself. Uh, meanwhile, music itself has has grown enormously uh, in, in genres, in, in in its expressive powers, in how it works uh, uh, as a cultural uh, binder. So um, nowadays, when people say, "Well, uh, classical music is dying." Music's in bad shape, and I, I, will, I will say music's never been in better shape than it is now, uh, mm-hmm. because there's so much music, and uh, and a person can customize a music uh, to themselves, you know, to their own life experience. Um, classical music, or certain classical pieces, might, might be part of that customized uh, music listening. Uh, but uh, if I have an example, you know, I have. Uh, as we talked about, I have many classical pieces that I rely on uh, for my own health and well-being. But I also really love Chicago blues. Uh, I love uh, uh, early rock and roll. Uh, I love stride building piano. I, I, I'm as eclectic as can possibly be. Uh, uh, does that mean that I don't like classical music? No, I, I do. Um, but I think the, the context that the classical music industry uh, provides for itself what may not be that attractive to younger uh, younger listeners. The classical music uh, world has operated on the principle that classical music is the pinnacle of uh, a person's musical uh, uh, development, and um, that that's an that's an antique uh, uh, way of thinking. Of thinking uh, it came out of the late eighteen uh, hundreds and early nineteen hundreds that. If one was to be a great citizen, one would aspire to classical music, and it, it's just completely outmoded now. And um, some orchestras, like the Baltimore Symphony, uh, are uh, are taking on uh, this notion uh, that uh, you have to be elite to come to concerts. Uh, many are still um, operating under the assumption that um, the symphonic repertoire and and the attendant uh, classical repertoire. Uh, uh, is the pinnacle of musical experience, and it's simply not true. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I mean, it, it it sucks that that has to be a kind of spreading mentality for a lot of people still. And I mean, it's music that I really love, but it's not something that I would enforce or or hold as this higher being of a thing. But but at the same time it's um it's there's still a lot that's there that's worthwhile to listen to and i guess my next question is maybe what you might tell someone who was maybe kind of interested in orchestral music or instrumental or classical music or whatever you want to call it um what you might tell someone who was interested in it but was kind of maybe depressed about how much they had to learn or listen to or how intimidating it yeah. looks well i would say forget about that you don't need to know anything to listen to to music uh any kind of music you don't you just have to uh, be alive <laughs> and allow yourself to feel uh what uh, you know what you're l- listening to um i also would say if it's at all possible uh, listen to music live, uh, especially orchestral music. Go inside the hall, which is just a big speaker, you know, and um, just let yourself 
feel the music that is surrounding you. Uh, and you don't need to know anything. You just have to feel. And um, uh, so those are a couple of things uh, that I would say. Uh, the question of dress and behavior uh, in, in an orchestra concert, for instance, I think we're moving away from uh, my parents' uh, generation. My parents are both deceased now. But the idea that you have to dress up uh, and, um, and behave yourself, uh, sit in a chair quietly, uh, wearing your best bib and tucker, uh, and look straight ahead and let the music, you know, and, and listen to the music. That's an, an outmoded uh, a way of thinking, too. You can dress however you want. Uh, n- nobody's going to kick you out of the hall. And, uh, and um, as to listening quietly, I, I go to a lot of colleges and I, you know, uh, am around a lot of m- many uh, uh, new time concert goers. Um, and what I like to tell them is that the air that's holding the music is like a canvas that's holding a painting. So if you were viewing the Mona Lisa, you, you wouldn't want to uh, uh, spot it with orange paint. When you're listening to a concert, you don't want to spot the air uh, with, uh, with sounds that are not part of the music. That is the equivalent of throwing orange paint on the Mona Lisa. So the quietness is a, a process. I'm glad to hear you say all this because, I don't know, I, I think some people probably disagree with me or kind of make fun of me in light when I say that I, I, I sometimes don't get what, what the idea is behind this almost strange pressure to take classical music as if you were performing some kind of sacred rite. And, uh, and uh, I mean, you can see that in kind of, there's another siren, geez. But yeah, I mean, uh, people wearing uh, tuxedos or suits or fancy dresses, to play the music is fine, you know, if that's what you want to wear, go ahead. But at the same time, I, I, I really don't mind if someone, <laughs> I, I don't mind even if they just come to stage with their violin and a jacket and dungarees, you know, I, I really don't care what they wear, you know, I I care more about what I'm about to hear. So it, it just seems like a dubious thing <laughs> to do. Culture, as you know, as it as it was in up until about nineteen in, uh, in the early part of the last century, the, the formal ensemble would be also would be um, is the orchestra. That it's a formal ensemble. It's uniform, and it's there so that so as not to distract the the mind of the listener. That that's changed in our culture. Completely changed. Uh, and um, the dressing up to go to the concert was really a, a partner to that to, to that formalness of the concert hall, and the, the formalness of the audience was part of that. But it's all loosened up. It's all changed. So, are there any other pieces that you perhaps wanted to talk about? Maybe the marimba concerto or parachute dancing, because there's a lot of pieces, and I was just kind of wondering if if there was a piece you had in mind. I didn't want to skip it or something. Also opera, mm-hmm. um, and um, if someone wished to listen to any of my art songs, for instance, mm-hmm. uh, they're on my website. There are, are many song cycles that are the "Try Me Good King" uh, and uh, uh, songs from letters, and my latest project, which is called the Birth Project, mm-hmm. which is uh, songs for sopranos and uh, and piano. Um, Uh, and texts by very fine poets and prose authors, female, expressing what it's like to give birth. So uh, my website is actually pretty comprehensive in that area. So so if if anybody's interested, I would say just hop on my website and you can hear uh, how I work with art song. Absolutely. Libby, you make me wish I didn't major in literature (laughs) for my uh english degree uh it's it's really interesting to hear about all of this music about the composition and um it's it's something that i'm i'm still trying to catch up with it's i love to play it on guitar i love to listen to it but i I still feel like i've got a lot of catching up to do and in some ways that's not a bad thing that's a really good thing but makes you feel better i feel the same way i'll never 
never <laughs> catch up with the music. So I just jump in and start start composing. That's cool. That's good to hear. So there were there were a lot of glitches. There were a lot of sirens, more than there usually are this morning, which is crazy. So Libby Larson, everybody. Her name is fun to say, and her music is great. Go listen to it. Visit her website. Uh, check out some CDs on Amazon. They're there. They're available. And that's it. Thank you so much for doing this uh, interview, Libby. I can't thank you enough. It's my pleasure. This was the Final Note Interviews. See you next time, everybody.